Okay, so I would like to welcome you to the Gelfand Recollections session, which we will have now. Uh, so, people who uh, knew uh, Israel Gelfand and had a chance to work with him, learn from him, will uh, kind of tell about their experiences. And of course, uh, probably in this room, uh, nobody is going to uh, doubt that uh, Gelfand was not just a mathematician, but he was a historical figure. This is why we need a professional historian uh, to chair this session. So I want to introduce uh, Slava Gerovich, who is a historian of mathematics, and who will chair this session. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, I will now speak first, uh, and okay. uh, there'll be uh, uh, lots of speakers today. Uh, uh, I'll ask you to limit your uh, remarks to seven to eight minutes, and I will name a speaker, and then also name the one who would follow, so that you would be able to prepare. But I think it would be a fitting tribute to uh, Israel Gelfand if uh, the chairman of the session would uh, take about half an hour before the speaker, the first speaker, has a chance to say a word, <laughs> to say, you know, what he thinks about the topic. <clears throat> um. So um, I, I would like just to uh, give you a little overview of Israel Gelfand's uh, life and some of the in interesting aspects of it, uh, particular of interest to us historians. Um, uh, he was born in 1913 into a Jewish family in the Pale of Settlement, uh, which means that uh, Jewish populations that lived in that, in that uh, area near Odessa actually uh, couldn't settle in major uh, metropolitan areas like Moscow, St. Petersburg. Uh, uh, in 1928, uh, he was expelled from trade school, uh, became an autodidact. He was expelled because after the revolution, his family was considered a bourgeois family, and the uh, children of such families could not be, uh, uh, were not allowed to get edu education in trade schools, so he uh, had to educate himself, and apparently did it very well, because in 1932, he became a graduate student of Andrei Kolmogorov, a leading uh, mathematician of the time in Moscow uh, University, and uh, in 1935, he already started teaching as a docent uh, or associate professor at Moscow University. In 1943, he started his famous seminar on functional analysis. First, it was indeed a seminar on functional analysis, and then gradually it expanded to include reputedly all of mathematics. In uh, 1953, he became head of the heat transfer department at the Institute of Applied Mathematics. Heat transfer is a, a euphemism for the uh, mathematical modeling of uh, the hydrogen bomb, and uh, Israel Moisevich was involved in this type of defense research. Uh, uh, he soon left that field, but uh, uh, that early work in, for, for, def for the defense secured him a place in, in the Soviet uh, academia and sort of shielded him from uh, uh, attacks. In 1967, uh, he became editor of Functional Analysis and its Application, a famous journal which uh, uh, is translated into English and uh, uh, which sort of set the famous Russian style of publications, uh, trying to fit so many publications into the journal uh, of uh, particularly uh, mathematicians who couldn't publish elsewhere because of various restrictions. Uh, he had to limit the size of publication to two or three pages, so many publications came out just with uh, statements of theorems without proofs, so they became uh, known as the Russian style. Uh, <laughs> um, in 1968, uh, he signed uh, uh, letters of protest to uh, Soviet authorities and, of course, suffered consequences for that. He couldn't travel abroad. Uh, in, uh, but uh, finally, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, or actually shortly before that, he was able to uh, travel and eventually became professor at Rutgers University, where he tried to continue his seminar and sort of ran it uh, as well. Uh, overall, uh, uh, he has authored and co-authored more than 560 research papers and monographs. And uh, in 1978-79, uh, he uh, was uh, the most cited mathematician in the world. Actually, he was probably the most cited even before and after that. 78-79 is simply the years for which a particular study, quantitative study, of citations was done for the mathematics community. Uh, so that's why we have specific figures for these years. But uh, he, uh, he was leading with a huge gap, so I presume some years before and some years after, he also occupied this leading position. 
Uh, but uh, Israel Moisevich was also famous not only in the world of mathematicians, but uh, beyond this uh, world. In 1957, he started an interdisciplinary seminar on mathematical methods in biology, neurophysiology, and medicine, uh, which then uh, expanded into a, uh, a regular seminar in collaboration with, uh, uh, with biologists. Uh, then in uh, uh, 1964, Gelfand set up an inter interdisciplinary um, laboratory at Moscow University where he employed uh, both uh, biologists and mathematicians, mathematicians who couldn't, uh, because of various restrictions of the Soviet regime, couldn't find employment elsewhere, and uh, uh, some outstanding mathematicians came out of that biological laboratory. So the, the collaboration between mathematics and biology under Gelfand's patronage was beneficial not only for biology but also for mathematics. Um, in 1963, uh, uh, when his son Vladimir went to uh, uh, school, he uh, uh, decided to, um, um, uh, to make a special arrangement with a uh, school number two in Moscow to uh, add uh, advanced specialized courses in uh, math and physics to the curriculum. And uh, uh, he himself lectured at school, introduced a system of lectures and seminars, sort of college type instruction in uh, high school. And this uh, essentially became uh, a, uh, a foundation for a whole movement of specialized physics and math schools in the Soviet Union. Uh, this uh, pattern was imitated uh, in other schools in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, in these schools, a whole, uh, several generations of uh, uh, students interested in mathematics received broad education, not limited to, specifically to mathematics. Um, but for um, Israel Moisevich, uh, mathematics was a specific uh, subject in which he uh, thought that anyone could, should be trained to uh, broaden one's intellectual horizons. He said, for human intellect, uh, the right attitude toward mathematics plays the same role as understanding music, poetry, and other non-profitable fields of human endeavor. Uh, this is why I have always tried to convey the beauty of mathematics to those who would never work in math later in life. And indeed, in those math schools, not everybody became a professional mathematician. Actually, his son Vladimir did not. Uh, but uh, um, besides mathematicians, many scientists, uh, writers, poets, uh, politicians came out of their schools. It, it became a, uh, a hothouse for intellect intellectual ferment in the Soviet Union. His another uh, famous initiative in 1964, uh, he set up a nationwide correspondence school of mathematics, uh, which, uh, um, which posted uh, uh, problem sets and then collected solutions and gave feedback to students all over the Soviet Union. Uh, over the years, it's still uh, functioning in, in Russia now. Over the years, over 70,000 uh, high school students participated in this uh, correspondence school of mathematics. And um, uh, it, in, in, at the time, in the late 60s, early 70s, a calculation was made that uh, more than a quarter of uh, all math students at Moscow University, at the famous MECMAT, had gone through that correspondence school of mathematics. That was a way to draw them into uh, math. And uh, finally, I'd like to say a few words about the famous uh, seminar of Israel Moisevich at Moscow University here in this building on the 14th floor in room 1408. The seminar ran continuously for uh, 47 uh, years from uh, uh, 1943 to uh, 1989. Every Monday, um, uh, Israel Moisevich ran the seminar, which gradually became uh, the hub of mathematical activity in Moscow and essentially in the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a famous room, 1409, where the seminar was held. Uh, many people here would, I'm sure, recognize it. Um, uh, just a few um, mm, uh, comments on the seminar made by its uh, participants. Uh, maybe the greatest seminar in the history of the mechanical and mathematical faculty of Moscow University one of the most productive seminars in the history of science, and made a decisive impact on mathematical life in Moscow, uh, ardently followed all that was new in mathematics anywhere in the world. So no wonder 
uh, people try to um, uh, come to the seminar. And even though the uh, territory of Moscow University was actually fenced, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, there were bureaucratic rules that didn't allow anyone who was not uh, affiliated with Moscow University to attend, uh, uh, to enter the territory and attend the seminar. Many people found ways to overcome these um, restrictions uh, by essentially <laughs> climbing the wall um, uh, and uh, reaching uh, this uh, source of mathematical knowledge. <coughs> Uh, very fortunately, uh, thanks to Mikhail Shubin, a long-term uh, participant in the seminar for 25 years, uh, who kept uh, notes, handwritten notes of the seminar proceedings, we now have this wonderful historical record of uh, uh, this seminar. Uh, uh, thanks to the support of the uh, Clay Institute of Mathematics and under the supervision of Sergei Gelfand, these uh, handwritten notes have been uh, scanned and are now posted online at the uh, website of the Moscow Center for Continuous Mathematical Education. If you just Google uh, Gelfand Seminar Notes, uh, you will come to that website with uh, uh, all the uh, notes indexed for names, so you would see all the, uh, you could easily locate uh, um, those sessions that were devoted to discussion of uh, the work of this or that mathematician. Um, uh, the Gelfand Seminar was famous not only for its mathematical context, uh, co uh, content, but also for its uh, wonderful idiosyncratic style, uh, on which we also have uh, uh, some interesting comments, uh, exciting but frightening, um, unfolded more like math improv, a kind of theater, a one-man show, I mean, it's good to you can draw to people to mathematics even with this, you know, theatrics. And uh, Gelfand ignored niceties. Speakers and participants were subjected to ruthless ridicule. Um, uh, so uh, I, 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 I think it's it's a wonderful historical question how uh, this idiosyncratic style gave rise to such wonderful uh, spirit of mathematical. Uh, adventure, and I hope uh, that speakers at this session would be able to comment on that. And finally, I'd like to show this uh, chart of uh, uh, connection. Uh, uh, it's actually uh, harvested from the uh, Mathematical Genealogy website, uh, which shows essentially a links between advisor and doctoral students. So these are just formal links, but informal, the Gelfand had much more uh, uh, informal links with all the people around them, and there are many people here who are mentioned on this graph, and uh, Kirillov, Bernstein, Kajdan, um, uh, Frankel, uh, uh, and um, I would, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to fill this uh, sort of dry picture with uh, real faces, names, and uh, uh, live memories. Uh, but before uh, uh, seating the podium to the, uh, uh, to the first speaker, I just want to uh, give you a little taste of uh, Gelfand Seminar. We have a unique video footage of uh, Israel Moisevich talking at his own seminar. And uh, let's see if we could, uh, uh, the, um, if we could run it now. I have to apologize, the uh, quality of the audio is very poor, uh, and I, I don't know if, if the technician would be able to help us to uh, crank up the volume so that we could all hear it. But in any case, I would, uh, I would run just for a minute, and that will explain what uh, Moisevich was saying there. And uh, the quality of the video is also, the picture is not very good, because the, the person who shot the video probably wasn't sure how Israel Moisevich would uh, treat that. Uh, um, effort, <laughs> so the the picture was shot from behind, you know, someone's back. So, <laughs> um, so let's see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
successo con la natura. watching a play called Princess Turandot by Carlo Gozzi. Yes, and um, uh, the, uh, watching the play called Princess Turandot by Carlo Gozzi. Uh, uh, the, the play is set in a, in a medieval setting, but the start of the play, as it was staged at Wachtangov Theater, was as follows. Uh, actors dressed in modern costumes um, enter the stage, and then on stage, they start changing into medieval uh, protagonists. So, uh, and then he said, the, the spirit of sort of modern interpretation of that play is conveyed not through placing it into the modern context, but through this uh, you know, explicit entering of a modern person into the skin of a, a medieval person. And he said, you know, his parables always have, always have this kind of mathematical meaning to them. And he said, you know, we mathematicians should also, should also do like that. I mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot always manage to do it, but we should learn from actors to, how to do it. So thank you. And uh, I'll now uh, uh, call to the podium uh, uh, Professor Is Zinger of MIT. much to say about Galfon and my relations with him, but I will, in this session, uh, stick to just one example. And uh, this was in Oxford. Galfon and I are sitting on a bench talking, and he said, I need a watch. Uh, let's go get me a watch. So we went to the jewelry store. It had an owner, and it had three uh, service people. And before you know it, they were all busy bringing watches for Galfon to look at. 
Gelfand knew an enormous amount about watches in every detail. And uh, I just stood back and watched how he checked out the detail of every watch in that shop, knew all about watches, and didn't buy anything because there was not a watch there that suited his tastes. I was impressed with his detailed knowledge of something to me which was rather crude, and that's how ordinary watches are made. I'll let it go at that, and maybe at some later stage, I'll tell you more about me and Gelfan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is um, uh, Professor Alexandra Balinson of the University of Chicago. Uh, after that, Professor Joseph Bernstein. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to begin at MIT on this great occasion. Uh, so, uh, uh, Gilfan's uh, mathematics and his seminar were a great part of my world for many years, starting from uh, the last year of high school. Now, I never was in uh, Israel Misich close orbit. And here are just um, three stories uh, connected with him that I cherish. Uh, Israel Mesich once uh, told me that after his work on the bomb, he was offered uh, positions of uh, power. For example, he could uh, become the head of Applied Mathematics Institute, uh, the institution that dealt with secret project. And he refused. And I would think that uh, he um, saw then clearly that doing uh, mathematics uh, requires inner freedom, which is incompatible with involvement in secret projects of the state. Well, you can compare it to the opposite choice of von Neumann, um, who stopped being mathematician after taking part in Manhattan Project. Well, the second piece is, um, as Ryan Message emphasized um, the, import the importance of uh, often emphasized the importance of common decency. And um, he did not think that he himself can discern clearly if this or that action of his was truly decent. And therefore, uh, he was, uh, Israel Mesich was asking someone he was sure uh, to be um, a decent person, and his choice was impeccable, uh, to be his advisor in matters of decency. And um, when advisor's position contradicted Israel Meisich's understanding of reality, the advisor was dismissed. <laughs> and uh, uh, this story I know from uh, a son of one such advisor. Uh, well, Israel Meisich told from time to time uh, that he considers himself being stupid. Well, you can ask actually what differs a fool's vision of the world uh, from that of a clever person. Uh, in a sense, uh, the progress of our knowledge is akin to um, a projection of a Hilbert space on a subspace of very small dimension. And understanding of some aspects of the world comes in package with forgetting of its other infinitely many dimensions. A fool knows nothing. Yet, as opposed to a professional, he retains the memory of that infinity, a distant call of unknown possibilities. Valoide Gilfan told me that Israel Mesich knew no biology, but was always able to identify true experts to talk to, and these discussions were often very beneficial for the biologists as well. Well, uh, a line in a poem addressed to Riakan Taigu, and Taigu means great fool, uh, by his teacher tells, how nice to be like a fool, for then one's way is grand beyond measure which is not unlike to the way of the greatest scientists, such as Israel Mesich was. Well, that's a piece I wrote, and uh, maybe I would add to it uh, a different piece. Uh, I got a letter from um, Spencer Bloch uh, with a nice uh, small piece about 
Gelfand and ask him if he would permit it for me uh, to read it. Uh, and he answered that, sure, but please emphasize that, of course, I have enormous respect both for Serre and for Gelfand. Well, now I read the piece. <laughs> uh, dear Sasha, I'm sure I told you my Gelfand story when he came to Paris and was to meet with Serre. He was staying at Armai, and the people at AHS needed someone to escort him to Paris. I was elected. I suggested we take a train with a plenty of time to spare so we would not inconvenience the great sir. Of course, I did not fully grasp the, the subtle thinking process of my charge. <laughs> Suffice it to say that, no, that not inconveniencing sir was rather low on the totem pole of Gelfand's priorities. <laughs> I arrived at his apartment and he announced that he would instruct me on the Russian technique for making tea. <laughs> so, of course, we missed the train. But I said, no matter, there would be another train along in 20 minutes. But no, Gilfan said that errors had occurred during the making of the tea. <laughs> and nothing would do except to return to his apartment and make more tea, <laughs> which we did. So, of course, we missed the next train. And as was clearly the intent from the beginning, the great sir was made to wait for the great Gilfand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Joseph Bernstein of the University of Tel Aviv. Next, uh, Professor Vladimir Drinfeld. Okay, I, I can tell such nice stories. <laughs> so uh, I first met with ILSH almost 50 years ago in 1963 when I became a freshman, and Kajdan took me to Gilfan's seminar. And after this, I was permanent member for some years and uh, became student of Gilfand, and I learned a lot of Gilfand. So just I want to give some examples. So Gilfand was interested for many years in meromorphic properties of P to the S to polynomial to some power. And the reason was that this was, as I understand, that this was a way to regularize some integrals which don't converge, but say, make sense. Somehow, I learned this from him, and when I read somewhere in the paper that integral doesn't converge, and this is somehow a problem, I just don't understand what they're talking about. Uh, so, and when uh, paper by Hiranaka appeared about the resolution of singularities, so Gifford said that this is probably the way to how to prove Morphic continuation. He organized a seminar on this paper. It was a very small seminar. It was Gilfant, myself, Kashdan, and Boy Mashizon. And we learned something. We haven't really learned Hiranaka, but I learned what a scheme, uh, just what is project, 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 project scheme, what is uh, just my main things because I never to cause an algebraic geometry. Uh, so, and several years later, we realized with Sergei that really this one of the results of Hiranaka really implies this meromorphic insulation. So now, uh, so I, uh, my problem was that I attended, I don't know, seven, maybe 10 seminars and so on. I learned a lot of mathematics. But somehow I didn't produce any work. And probably Gilfand realizes, and he invited myself and Sergei Gilfand to collaborate. And somehow I would formulate that we were apprentices to the great master. And we started around 1967, we started to collaborate. So first we started 
differential operators on a fine space. It was a continuation of his work with Sasha Kirillov. And so we did some interesting computations, but then we realized that uh, it led us to some description to highest weight models, and we realized we can give very simple proof of uh, weight character formula. Okay, so. Uh, Just, uh, so we were meeting once a week, so usually on Wednesday. So usually it was the following way, that we would come in the morning, 10 o'clock, and then we would uh, work with Serge, and Gilfand would do some things, some administrative stuff, some, and then around 2-3 he would also join, and then we'll continue until the deadline was at one o'clock, at one o'clock in, in the night, the uh, matter was closed. Sometimes we, mess, we missed this deadline, we took the taxi. So this was how it was organized. But mathematically it was organized that usually Gilfat would come up with some idea. For instance, one of these once we came there and he showed us some paper by Humphrey about Cartan matrices representations of finite modular representation of finite groups. And he said that what we did with Verm models probably has some relation to this. And we really worked this out and really realized that it's very similar thing. That's how category O has period. And important thing to realize is that somehow we were not really good with category C. It was, we knew what it is, but it was not our language to talk. So later it became uh, uh, language. So, um, so an another thing which I wanted to say is uh, Gitfund was simultaneously involved in many projects, and one of them was, for many years, he was very much interested in problems of linear algebra, just some finite dimensional problems, some classification, and so on. He had many works with Volodya Panmaryov uh, on this subject, for, for instance, studying, on, for subsp studying, for instance, Karnaker problem, which was discussed here, studying four subspaces. In, in, in the space and so on. And at some moment, so we came, uh, came to him uh, in the morning and he uh, showed us paper by um, Gabriel, so classification of uh, representations of quivers, and said since, that it was clearly very interesting for us because the answer was given in terms of the algebras. Uh, so, and then it turned out that uh, uh, Gilfant and Panmaryov in the investigation of um, four subspaces, they had some construction, some, I don't remember how they called it, it's some Coxter factor, and so, so just Based on this idea, somehow we uh, were able to, uh, to, to modify it and make uh, to make conceptual proof of uh, Gabriel's result, which somehow is, was very later used. Uh, so I want also to say something about the uh, seminar. So seminar, the format of seminar was very, very unusual. So it would start, I don't remember, seven probably. It was official starting time. It's very rare that he would stay, start before 7.30. Usually it would start 8.30. <laughs> 
and uh, so it was, uh, but it was in fact, it, sometimes it was irritating, but it was in fact, as I understand, very um, productive because people would walk around, it's, you have seen this room, but before this room there was large hall where people would walk and talk and so on. So it was some kind of mathematical club in addition to seminar. So usually when some important person from abroad would come, then seminar would start more or less on time. But in other cases, it never starts on time. And also, the topic would be announced with advance, but usually it would be changed at the last minute. <laughs> okay, so I think that's Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Vladimir Drinfeld. Uh, after that, Tatiana Israelovna Gelfand. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a student of uh, Gelfand uh, in the literal sense, but I think uh, I belong to his school uh, in a broader sense. Uh, let me now explain why. Mm, I was a student of Manin. And it was Manin who taught me algebraic geometry and some number theory. And formally, he was my, own, my only teacher. But informally, I also had another advisor, namely Ilya Yosefovich Petetsky Shapiro. And it was Petetsky Shapiro uh, who taught me uh, automorphic forms and uh, some uh, representation theory. Now, Petetsky uh, Shapiro's uh, approach uh, to these areas was strongly influenced by Israel Moisevich Gelfand. Uh, this was one reason why I think I belong to Gelfand school in a broad sense. Uh, another reason is that uh, throughout my life, uh, I, was, I, I learned a lot from uh, Gelfand's students and uh, students of his students, and maybe now uh, the next generation. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm able to list all the names, but uh, as a first year undergraduate, I attended a, a seminar for beginners run by uh, Kirillov. Uh, I learned a lot from Andrei Zelevinsky with whom we were of the same age. Uh, then I learned from uh, Kajdan Bernstein, from Victor Ginsburg, uh, from uh, Bernstein's students, uh, uh, Dennis Gates Gorey and uh, Roma Bezrukavnikov, and probably from many, from many other people. Uh, uh, on the other, so I started to attend uh, Gelfand's seminar in 1971 when I was a third year undergraduate student. At that time I had no idea that uh, I'm, I was going to uh, become a member of the Gelfand school in the broad sense. Uh, I was already a student of Manin, and uh, I knew that I was uh, going to do algebraic geometry with some number theory, but I had no idea that representation theory is almost a part of algebra. Uh, I, it, it was not clear then to me that, uh, al that representation theory is so closely related to uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, the reason I began to attend Gelfand's seminar was because other students uh, told me that this is very important to acquire a general mathematical culture. And so it was. Uh, now, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, I, although I was uh, unable to understand all the talks uh, at the seminar, but there were some of them that I was able to understand. Uh, for instance, uh, I 
um, I was able to understand uh, Bushstaber's explanation of uh, Larzar's uh, universal one-dimensional formal group law, which was given at the seminar. Uh, I, th I was able to understand the easier part of Wasserstein's talk on uh, algebraic K-theory, but of course not the, um, not the parts that are morally related to spectra. Uh, uh, I think I was able to understand uh, the definition of uh, wavefront uh, due to Hermander, which was given in a, I think, in a talk by Schnirelmann, and probably some other things. Uh, now, um, an important event in my life uh, happened in 1975 at uh, Gelfand's uh, seminar. Uh, namely, I attended a talk by Igor Krichever, and the talk was about uh, com commutative uh, subrings of uh, the ring of differential operators in one variable. Uh, and uh, at that time, I was studying uh, commutative uh, subrings of another non-commutative ring, uh, namely the non-commutative ring of endomorphisms of an additive of the additive group viewed as an algebraic group over a field of characteristic P. Uh, now, it's uh, it is well known that uh, and easy to see that this non-commutative ring is formally very similar to the ring of differential operators and um, uh, what was important for me that was that when I um, understood, uh, when I thought about Kritschever's talk, I uh, realized that uh, uh, his results can be uh, reformulated in more algebraic terms, and that after such reformulation, uh, one can uh, use them to describe non uh, commutative subrings of uh, the uh, ring of endomorphisms of the additive group in characteristic P. And this eventually led me to the proof of uh, the uh, Lang global Langlands conjecture for GL2 over a functional field of characteristic P. Now, the important, uh, now I, I want to emphasize that Gelfand's seminar was uh, at that time one of the very few uh, places in the world where uh, a person uh, working on, uh, in characteristic P uh, could meet uh, another person, uh, like uh, Igor Krichever, who was working on uh, integrable uh, differential equations. Mm. Okay, now, uh, soon after that, I, uh, Gelfand asked me to explain my approach to Krichever's theory at his seminar. I gave a talk on the subject and I think I remember Gelfand's uh, reaction. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So his reaction was as, after the talk was as follows. Uh, he said, we have listened to Drinfeld and uh, he uh, told us some uh, pretty reasonable things that we, don't, that we do not completely understand. Uh, but this is not because he is so clever. Uh, this is because he speaks a foreign language, uh, or maybe a language that we haven't yet mastered. Uh, if a Turkish boy uh, w would come here and speak uh, Turkish, we wouldn't be able to understand him either. I think this is what he said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, well, a few years after that, I had to leave 
Moscow. Uh, so I, but I visited Moscow from time to time, and uh, when I visited, I usually attended Gelfand seminar. And uh, during one of such uh, visits, I uh, showed Gelfand uh, the uh, quantization of the uh, universal enveloping algebra of a uh, semi-simple Lie algebra. And uh, I remember that he was uh, very happy. His eyes were happy, so to say. And uh, probably the reason was that he uh, loved uh, nice, explicit elementary formulas. And in this case, there was indeed such a form. And he loved them regardless of whether it was he who discovered this or another person. Uh, probably another re re reason why he was happy was that this was uh, not a solution of a problem, but uh, something different. It was, uh, I, I would say that this was uh, not a move forward, but a move sideward. And this is what I think he loved. Uh, most. Uh, but I think even Gelfand, with all his experience, was unable to predict how this tool would be used by uh, people like, by other people, for instance, by George Lustig, who would use it to um, construct canonical basis. And of course, I couldn't uh, even imagine this. Okay. Now, mm, uh, finally, let me uh, tell you that uh, when I supervise uh, uh, graduate students, uh, of course, I uh, uh, when I supervise graduate students who are learning uh, representations of reductive groups over local fields, uh, of course, I recommend them to read the article by Bernstein and Zelivinsky, uh, but uh, I also r recommend them to uh, read uh, the corresponding part of uh, volume six of generalized functions by Gelfand. And uh, one of the, the re well, as Berns Joseph Bernstein explained to us, uh, the uh, language of categories was not yet familiar uh, around, let's say, 1970 uh, in the Soviet among Gelfand students. This, one could say that this was not so good, but one could also say that life was in some sense better when people didn't know this language. So <laughs> nowadays the situation is opposite. People uh, learn uh, the language of categories uh, from the very beginning, but uh, they don't learn it in a true sense, they learn it in a formal sense somehow. So, uh, when you, uh, and, uh, uh, when, when, the, when you just read modern expositions, you uh, don't see that a, a lot of things can be done when you realize that you are basically doing one-dimensional analysis. You just have to recall the technique that you learned in uh, college or maybe in high school. And when you read uh, the volume six of generalized functions, uh, then you see this. Oh, uh, so, I uh, so now I recommend to read uh, volume six as a kind of uh, antidote to uh, categorical, more categorical and uh, algebraic approaches. Okay, thank you for your attention. Next is Tatiana Israelovna Gelfand, the daughter of uh, Israel Maisevich. Yeah, just wanted to see the picture. Yeah, that's uh, me up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wasn't uh, quite sure what to talk about because. 
obviously, as many of you have figured out, I'm not a mathematician. Um, I, uh, it was never my intention to be a mathematician. So I was thinking, what can I talk about? What would be interesting for people to know about Israel that they don't already know? And the, I'm going to start with the questions that I often get when I see people that knew my father for a long time. Um, I usually get asked, how, he, how was he as a father? I think the real question is, how was he as a father in his old age? Um, he was 68 when I was born. So, <clears throat> and the other thing that I often get asked is kind of a two-part question. I get asked, how did he teach me mathematics? And uh, which he did. It's hard to imagine that he didn't, right? <laughs> but I, th I think the, the real question that people want answered is uh, how he felt about the fact that I didn't go into mathematics. And I think, once again, that's not the real question that people want to have an answer to. Uh, what people, I think, usually want to know is did he feel like he failed to push me into mathematics? Was he too old to uh, get me to do mathematics, so to speak? Or did he sort of let me go willingly? And this is what I want to talk about because I think that's not the right question to ask. Um, I think many of you knew my father uh, when he was, met him when he was in his 70s and his 80s and his 90s. And I don't think anyone here would venture to tell me that he did not have a strong personality at that age. <laughs> so I think that if he wanted me to be a mathematician, I would be somewhere in the scientific field. <laughs> so I guess the real question is, what changed, you know? And I was thinking about this. And when he was 77 years old and I was nine years old, we immigrated to America. Now, I think had we been in the Soviet Union, I think my father would have made sure that I go into sciences at least if not mathematics, because in the Soviet Union, this was a fairly uh, free uh, field in a sense that a person could um, have some freedom to think how they wanted to work on what they were interested in. And when we came to America, that obligation was no longer there. And so what did my father teach me other than mathematics? And how did I um, make my choices in life? And the reason I want to talk about myself in this case is because um, I think I was part of those interactions, right? So if you understand where I'm coming from, I think it will be very clear where, where Israel is coming from. Um, from, a, from a very young age, he would ask me what it was that I wanted to do. And, you know, different age, I answered a different, I had a different answer. But he was always insisting on this question. He wanted me to say what I wanted to do. And I remember one anecdote that he told me, and I think he, uh, he often repeated his anecdotes, so uh, possibly a number of you have heard it. Uh, it's an old, uh, it's in fact an old Hasidic story about Rabbi Zusha. And Rabbi Zusha is on his deathbed. And someone, perhaps one of his, uh, Rabbi Zusha's students asks him, Rabbi Zusha, how do you feel about the life you've lived? And Rabbi Zusha answers, he says, 
when I, when I die and when I will talk to God, God will not ask me, why were you not Moses? He will ask me, why were you not Rabbi Zusia? So my father believed that every person has a unique destiny. Uh, this is something that he often told me and that um, it's, it's important to find your destiny. Not, not in the sense of it's important to find it to be happy. The, there wasn't that implication. The implication was God gives you, I, I say God as sort of a, uh, a, a blank. Uh, he, he said, you, you are born with something. You, you get a gift. You're born with a gift. You're born with something. And as a human being, you have an obligation to use it while you're, you know, while you're alive. And this is what he taught me. And this is, uh, this and because we, we did move to America and I grew up in, a, in America where there was a number of fields where I could um, work in with a certain freedom that I, I could, I had a chance to, um, to uh, answer that, that questions. Um, so, and the last thing I wanted to say um, was that um, I think, l looking, looking back at my father, I think that he lived by this principle. He, he didn't just teach me this principle of find your destiny, find something you're, that's natural and obvious for you to do. Th this is how he lived his life. And because it's, I think, clear to uh, most of you here that he was born with a, with a certain gift. Um, where it came from, no one knows, but he was uh, born with a certain gift and it was his destiny and um, he used it to the fullest in his life. So, thank you. Tatiana Vladimirovna Gilfand. Yeah, I had a difficult time choosing an episode about, about Gelfand. And the reason was that what, um, what is maybe unusual and remarkable episodes for other people was what filled my everyday life for 30 years. <laughs> so it was one big, one long episode. And, <laughs> and uh, I, in my mind, I still feel his presence and uh, his sayings and comments and especially anecdotes that ju they just pop out in my mind at random times. I just want to mention one thing that uh, it's uh, that all the uh, recognition and honors which he had in his life didn't change him as a person. There were many times, uh, usually after like special events, uh, like honorary, honorary, honorary events or special, uh, special lectures of Israel that I told him, uh, you are so great, you, you are so famous, you know everything. <laughs> you are such a great mathematician. And his response to this was, who, me, <laughs> great? <laughs> I don't know anything. And then he would start naming works of different mathematicians, but you know, like, and he would come up with names and works and areas of mathematics which he has to learn. And that went on for, uh, until he died, you know, it was, it took place all the time. It never ended. It was, he was in his 90s and he would still give the same response. And at times he added, the saying which I remember very well, uh, the, minute I I, the minute I believe that I am great, 
I will be finished as a mathematician. So I just want to make three announcements. So that was it for, <laughs> for the uh, memories. I um, want to make three announcements. Probably many of you heard that uh, he was writing a book on geometry for high school students. We started writing this book uh, when we lived in Boston in 1990 on the 31st floor of the MIT housing building. And the first thing when I woke up in my hotel room was to see that the top part of this building, you know, that's how things happen in life. And um, uh, the book, uh, well, that's when we started in 1990, and then, as they say, life happened. <laughs> that's the most, <laughs> the best answer I can give. Uh, the manuscript was completely ready by September 2009, a 96th birthday of Israel, and he knew about it. But unfortunately, publication process is taking a long time. <laughs> and, uh, but now it seems like the, the book, the manuscript, is really at the finish line. So, My second announcement is, um, is the following. Uh, this August, I reopened the Gelfand Correspondence Program in Mathematics, which he started at Rutgers in 1991. Uh, it, will, it, it is based on the same assignments and same books, and actually in the future I plan to extend it and include maybe some materials on which he planned to write with me, and I might, I have some notes, I mean, I definitely have the notes, and so I will see if I will be able to, to put them back to life. I mean, not back to life, but the first time to life. And uh, the program is now called EGCPM, which stands for Ex Extended Gelfand Program in Mathematics. You can look um, online at our website, israelm.com. Israel what did I say? Israelmgelfand.com. Uh, and of course, later on, there will be a separate website. So if any of you know uh, students of ages 14, 17 who might be interested in this program, please let them know. My third, uh, my third announcement um, needs a bit of explanation. When uh, Gelfand passed away, there was an avalanche of people's reaction and different writings about him. And many people mentioned how much he helped them in their lives, uh, which went uh, far beyond mathematics and education. And I just felt that it would be great to use all this enthusiasm and all this gratitude of so many people to keep the memory of Gelfand in the future. So I thought, I, had, I decided to open a Gelfand Memorial Fund. But for what? For mathematics? Israel himself said that uh, the beauty, or one of the beauties of mathematics is that in order to do it, all that one needs is a well-sharpened pencil and paper. That was very essential that it had to be well-sharpened, and those who were in Moscow probably remembered it from seeing him. Uh, uh, later on, though, he switched to automatic pencils, which I have like a few boxes <laughs> in my basement. Um, so um, I, wanted, I really wanted to distinguish him as a person that he was, and not just as a not, not only as a mathematician. Uh, once he said to me, that actually in the last year of his life, he said to me that very early in life, he decided to devote his life to helping people. And that was very true. So somehow mathematics was, uh, I believe that that was more core and mathematics was kind of his way of doing it. And he ex extended well beyond that. Uh, but how do you acknowledge a person for, for this? Uh, and uh, I mean, you can look at our website. I have some thoughts that I went through. 
to make it short, I established Gelfan Memorial Fund at, uh, at a non-profit organization which we supported with him for over 13 years. It's called PCRM, which stands for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Again, you can look at our website or look at their website uh, to know more. I felt that Israel's beliefs and the principles of PCRM are based on the same values, which is science, ethics, and helping people. Um, Israel was, was highly supportive of their work, and uh, numerous times he told me that these directions, uh, which I can probably explain as bringing more ethics into different areas of people's lives, that these directions are of a major importance in the modern world. He was thinking a lot about, let's say, global problems that the mankind is facing, and he was, even though he was so thorough and so broad in mathematics, he, he was always thinking on, on a broad picture you know, of everything. Um, so you can look for details at the same website, israelmgelfand.com. I just want to share one thought about this fund. In his Kyoto talk, Israel said that the adequate language for humanitarian values has yet to be developed. Maybe uh, establishing this opportunity uh, for people to express their appreciation of a person and their gratitude to someone by supporting what he supported by supporting what he believed in and what he believed in, believed was essential for the uh, benefit of all people can be uh, a step in developing this adequate language. Uh, I would be very grateful to all of you who like my idea and who will make a gift to Gelfand Memorial Fund. Again, see our website for details. It's, uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, the next person on the uh, program is uh, Semyon Gindikin, and after that, Alexander Goncharov. Uh, Semyon Gindikin, um, a student of Israel Gelfand, a long-term collaborator, was planning to come and give his memories here at the session, but unfortunately he uh, had, had an accident and uh, uh, was taken to a hospital, so he couldn't come, but he uh, kindly recorded his memories uh, and sent us a video. Um, uh, the video is uh, more than 30 minutes long. Uh, so uh, I took an editorial decision and uh, um, shortened it uh, to about seven minutes. Uh, so we'll see the last seven minutes of uh, uh, Simon Gindikin's um, memoir. Dear friends, will, uh, some pieces that I cannot be uh, with you now. We'll, uh, we'll post the entire video uh, on the web, a link to the entire video on the web, so you'll be able to uh, hear uh, all of it. But uh, here, um, uh, I will just... Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting video. Uh, um, but unfortunately, we have limited time, so... Um, let's see, I probably should lower the volume a bit, see how it works. Uh, here, um, uh, Gindikin would talk about one specific episode of uh, Gelfand's life related to the period uh, in the late Stalin period when uh, uh, anti-Semitic campaigns were launched and sometimes pretexts were used to fire Jews from, uh, uh, from their positions, pretexts like uh, uh, part-time work uh, in two different places who could be used to fire a person from uh, one or, or both. Uh, and then he would make some remarks generally of, uh, on the significance of uh, Israel Gelfand. And in this moment, I know it's not directly, but from very uh, trustful uh, souls that in a short time 
he was fired from as professor Moscow University and simultaneously from Stiklov Institute Mathematical Institute where he was uh, uh, he was chairman of the department of functional analysis by the way it was uh, uh, in in uh, university he was fired since uh, they started to uh, fight with work simultaneously in different places, so he was fired since he has permanent job in mathematical institute, and in mathematical inst from mathematical institute he was fired since he has a job in uh, uh, Stiklov Institute. But what uh, interesting is that uh, both or, uh, bo bo both. Uh, uh, orders were, uh, were uh, signed the same person, director of Stiklov Institute, academician Vinogradov, and uh, vice rector of Moscow Uni University, academician Vinogradov. Uh, around this time, uh, uh, he started to work um, in uh, Keldish. Uh, Applied mathematics in the beginning department and then uh, and the institute. He was strongly involved in uh, uh, classified work. I believe for several years it was a, a way to survive. He was very successful, but again we know just a little. Sakharov, uh, in his memoirs, mentioned collaboration with Israel Misevich. Also in Moscow, where it was uh, just now uh, centennial conference, there uh, was some um, information about this work. Israel Misevich, I believe, uh, didn't like to recall this, uh, his work also, but it was very strong byproduct. Uh, 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 his work in differential equation. By the way, behind seminar, it was also famous each year one course, one mathematical course. I uh, uh, listened last of this course about representation. It was uh, fifth, basically it was fifth uh, volume of uh, theory of uh, distribution. He already stopped after this to teach course, and sometimes it was extra seminars uh, in the same uh, uh, mind. Okay, uh, so I, uh, it was not uh, simple to live to and work in Soviet Union, and it was uh, not uh, simple to survive there. Uh, uh, it was uh, people, it was not just uh, too much uh, careful, uh, care not discuss these things. I remember perfectly my father, who also very carefully, uh, very little discuss uh, situation with his origin, with his... Uh, anyway, uh, what I show is that Israel Maisich uh, had very happy, very, uh, very happy, and very successful mathematical life. <coughs> and uh, what I want to mention that Israel Mesich always uh, very early started to seriously care about his uh, health, and also he was care about his mathematical health. I remember many times uh, he repeat, if you want to continue successfully work when you are 40, you need to continue to uh, read, uh, to continue to study new things all your life. Uh, there are different kinds of mathematicians. Some people uh, continue uh, to solve an uh, interesting problem as soon as possible, but there are people who try to guess the future. Uh, I think that Israel Message was one of the best 
in uh, prediction future of mathematics, and he tried to do. Any uh, uh, his collaborator knows how fantastic predictor uh, was he. Uh, by the way, it's very interesting. Uh, many mathematicians think about uh, uh, future. Uh, we know several uh, uh, interesting examples. Some people, uh, great mathematician, thought about the end of mathemati uh, mathematics in different keys, uh, Leibniz and Lagrange. Uh, uh, by the way, Euler, son Euler uh, recalls that uh, in last year, uh, in last years, uh, Euler uh, talked, tried to guess how uh, what how it was will possible to uh, to to learn in mathematical news and parodies. And his conjecture was that it's possible new what is true, what is not, but on some reason difficult to uh, to to uh, new proofs. And I think it was not just a joke for him. And the Zrin Message many times on his seminar discuss uh, future, and uh, I think he guess about many things. He, be, uh, he was very good uh, in building conjectures. His uh, famous talk where he uh, state some uh, um, future, and we know how they, uh, inf uh, they were uh, exact and had influence and uh, future development and mathematics. And I also, and I had of many, uh, many people who worked with Israel Misich, that in such form, uh, he continued to live with us. We often try to guess what, uh, how he would be think about such and such things. So, I finish here and I uh, thank you uh, very, very much. Thanks. Uh, Alexander Goncharov of Yale University. After that, Victor Guillemin of MIT. Thank you very much. Uh, the first thing somehow, when it, as I see in my eyes, when I try to remember Israel message, is Israel message coming to the seminar and he carries his dark uh, uh, brown bag. Uh, so can you speak to the microphone? Oh, that's difficult. So he carries his dark brown bag and this bag uh, is heavy. It's about 10 to 15 pounds, my recollection, and it's filled with, by, uh, with papers, and these papers are mostly in English. Some of them were in French, but mostly in English. So this was a paper which was sent to him by uh, foreign mathematicians. This was the way we learned about what happens on the West, and somehow I feel this was somehow corresponding members of the seminar. So uh, Israel message. Uh, as we all know, was capable of doing many miracles uh, during his long lifetime. And um, when I come here and see so many members of his uh, seminar somehow integrated along the time, and so many uh, foreign members of his uh, seminar, I some, somehow feel that he is still capable of doing miracles. And so that's one of them. Uh, so um, I wanted to I have some stories about Israel Masih, but basically uh, I want to say a little bit about his role in education of uh, mathematicians. So I myself first met his somehow system when I was uh, in high school almost 40 years ago, because when I, that was when I became, uh, was enrolled in his correspondence school about which uh, Tanya Gelfman just said will continue. And so I didn't know at that time that this was created by Israel Masevich, but it, it, plays, it was an important part of my mathematical education. And uh, then, uh, as you know, this was created somewhere in 63 or 64. Uh, around the same time, as we also were told, uh, 
uh, Israel Masich younger son, Valody, he was not accepted to the mathematics school which was existing at that time, and so Israel Masich decided that one needs to do one more school, and he created this mathematical classes as school number two, and where his son, Valody, was uh, educated, as far as I know, and this school had enormous uh, impact on the development of um, mathematics in Soviet Union and many uh, people here from this school, although uh, Valody did not become a mathematician. Then, uh, when I was at university, this was around 1980, uh, uh, so Israel Masich um, came to me and to Yura Shmelyov and said that we had to have a seminar for uh, young participants of his uh, seminar, kind of smaller seminar, because he said that we should prepare them, um, you know, to all new notions that they're going to encounter there. And usually when Israel Message said something, I consider this as an advice. Like, you have to learn quantum mechanics by, by, you know, by, by next month. It's a good advice. If you don't learn it, fine. So here I realized very quickly this is not an advice. This is an order. The reason behind this was the following, that it was now grandson of Israel Message, Misha, uh, son of <laughs> Sergei Israelich and <laughs> Galina Vladimirovna, who uh, was entering university, he was just a freshman, and so Israel Message decided like, you know, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, that he needs to be educated and something needs to be done about this, and so that was an order. So we tried to escape and said, well, we are not going to do this, but basically we started in doing this, and the seminar lasted for, for five years, uh, all the years when Misha was in university. Misha, <laughs> <laughs> actually after that, uh, those who survived, there were only two participants who survived the seminar, and so the seminar moved to, to, to my apartment, last till we all somehow uh, went to, to the West, and I would say that this was extraordinarily useful for me. So I, uh, this was probably one of the most important things which Israel Message did for me, because I learned enormous, uh, you know, first, first of all I learned that I love to do this, uh, because what we had, what, what, I, what one needs to be done is to go to every uh, week to university, and for about two hours you have to entertain these bright students who were about two to four years younger than me, and Yura was uh, two years older than me, uh, so we have to entertain them, and it has to be a different subject uh, next week, so we didn't follow any kind of particular development. And so we had, I mean, to prepare them, so if, if something pops up on the seminar, then Gelfand would, would uh, you know, blame us for that we didn't prepare them, that they didn't know that, they, didn't, they do not know this or that, and so on. And so, so for it was seminar, like, like, like we tried to, 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 to teach them uh, everything, and as I said, so, I, I benefited enormously from that, and I continue to benefit uh, from, uh, you know, from this till this day. So that, that was great. What? So, so that, that was one story about, so to speak, the role of Israel in education. I also want to tell another story, which I already actually uh, had a chance to, to say once, but I somehow was, it made a big impression on me. So the story is uh, the following. It's uh, um, one day I was uh, sitting in, I mean, talking about this anime stage, the, the, the main point was that he was an amazing personality, <coughs> uh, very unusual, uh, very original, and it was very difficult to predict what will happen next moment. He was kind of very natural, but, but I had always problem to predict what was going to happen, and here's an example. So I was sitting one day in each year, this was something like 1996, and reading a uh, uh, translation to Russian of a uh, recall the by uh, Grotendieck, and uh, that was very interesting because I read only the introduction. The introduction was very interesting because Grotendieck was, tell, uh, was talking about things, how to do mathematics, and uh, what is his point of view of mathematics, and he was saying that mathematics is not a sport, mathematics is not a subject where you should try to prove theorems, mathematics is a, kind of about a, another thing, so you should not try to prove theorems, you should try to understand things, and, uh, and so on and so far. Uh, and uh, he was talking about uh, one of the main impressions that he had with this letter of uh, Riemann to his father, was, where he was saying that, uh, that he just submitted some paper on 
uh, zeta function, about, uh, some paper on number theory to proceedings of the academy, but this was not the most important thing. The most important thing he was thinking about is about the space, whether it's continuous or discrete, that what was on the Grothendieck mind. And so I was reading all this and I realized that I actually knew all this, and I heard all this literally before, and then I started to think why I know this, and I realized I heard all this from Israel Messiah on his seminar. Because in his seminar, he was saying literally this uh, very often, including the let letter from uh, Riemann to his father. This was his favorite topic of Israel Messiah. And so my impression, my first idea was that, of course, now it's clear that Israel Messiah went to Paris, so Grothendieck, they talk about this. Now he came back and he's telling us the story. Fine. Or maybe the other way. Maybe he told Grothendieck, who knows. Then I realized that Israel Misich told us that he never saw Grothendieck and he does not understand how the savage can do mathematics. He did mathematics, he's a great mathematician, but it's, it's completely foreign to him. But he said, if I ever saw his back, then I would understand. So that was clear that he never saw his back. So, and there was never ever discussion. And so I was still puzzled because, for example, I remembered interview of Gelfand to uh, Quant, when he was saying that the most important years of his education were years when he was like 13, 14, 15, when he spent in solitude in somewhere in, in Ukraine and was thinking about mathematics, and that's when and where his uh, aesthetics of mathematics uh, was somehow created. That's, that's where he understood how to do mathematics. And he was talking specifically about calculus. He said that I don't care how you define the integrals, I just want to calculate some integrals. And he mentioned some person who had some medical problem and had device like that. He said, I wanted to calculate the volume of this, of, of this thing uh, that this person need, needed. And then Grothendieck, you read uh, at the same recall cement, he said that the most important uh, years in my mathematical education, when I was 13, 15, 16, I was in solitude, and that's where my, all my aesthetics was, you know, was done. And he said about calculus, I was bored by all those problems, how to calculate this, how to calculate that. <laughs> and he said that the only thing I wanted to understand what is an integral and how to calculate them, it, it, I don't really care. <laughs> so it was basically the same thing with some little variations. <laughs> so, uh, so I was thinking about this for a few minutes and then I saw Israel Message. Israel Message, he was 96, I mean, the year was 1996, so he was 83, or maybe it was 97, don't remember. He was approaching me very slowly and asking, what are you doing? I said, reading Grothendieck. He said, hmm, is it interesting? I said, yes, it's interesting. And he said, why it's interesting? And so I told him the story, maybe a little quicker than, than you. And then I, I mean, I can't resist to ask him the question because I understood it's not fair. You can't ask this question now, but I can't resist. I, I said, is it message? Why is this? Is why such a coincidence? Why, why you told us all these things which, which Grothendieck writes in his book and I know you never saw, saw him. And so I was sure that's an unfair question and he, it's kind of, you know, there is no answer to this question, he would never answer. And, but still, I asked ask this question. 20 seconds uh, of silence, as when she was thinking. 20 seconds, not, not one minute, 20 seconds. I said, I know. I said, yeah. He said, well, it's very simple. You know, Grothendieck, uh, he was from Hasidic family. <laughs> and I told you, he said, long time ago, that I'm a direct descendant of Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> and so then, after that, he immediately, very slowly, uh, walked away. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, uh, Victor Guillemin from MIT. And after that, uh, Mikhail Kapranov of Yale University. Well, like is, I'll be fairly brief. Um, uh, I, I, uh, first learned about Gelfand as a graduate student in the 60s and in fact uh, 
for those of us who were of the generation of the 60s, uh, Gelfand was really one of the pivotal figures in mathematics. I mean, we devoured uh, Gelfand Neumark, uh, the wonderful, his wonder, wonderful work uh, with Leviton on ODE theory. Um, and uh, um, the uh, Gelfand Schilaf books were just beginning to appear, Theory of Distributions. Um, and, uh, and so for those of my generation, uh, Gelfand was an absolutely pivotal figure. Unfortunately, however, it was difficult at that time for American mathematicians to get to the Soviet Union, and uh, I guess even more difficult for Soviet mathematicians to get to the States. So I, uh, for a long time, never had a chance to meet Gelfand personally, on a personal basis. Um, well, uh, but uh, that changed uh, in the mid-1970s. Uh, um, it, it was discovered that there is one interesting way to get Soviet mathematicians um, to the United States, and that's to give them honorary degrees at universities. Um, and, and Harvard went this route, and I think it was in 1976 or 77, um, gave Gelfand an honorary degree, so he came to Harvard, came to Cambridge to get this honorary degree, and I had the great honor of being appointed his temporary assistant for the week that he was at Harvard. Um, I guess Gopher would perhaps be a better characterization of my duties, but at any rate, um, I had uh, the chore of chauffeuring him around, of uh, squiring him around Cambridge, uh, taking him out to lunch, and uh, uh, escorting him from his hotel to the math department and whatnot. And um, also, uh, I, I discovered he was passionately fond of music, so we went to virtually every record store in the Boston area looking at records. And, and it was an absolutely wonderful week for me. I, I uh, uh, had wonderful conversations with him, not only about mathematics, but... Uh, um, I shared to a certain extent his enthusiasm about music, so we had long discussions about that as well. Um, there were basically only two negative experiences I remember from that week. One was actually a very negative experience. Uh, um, here was Gelfand, who, you know, for many of us was the greatest mathematical figure of the 20th century. Um, and every day, uh, this, is, this, this ref, uh, repeats a little bit what uh, Gendikin said in the video that we just heard, every day he had to phone the Soviet embassy and, uh, well, the conversations were in Russian, but I guess inform them that he hadn't yet defected. Uh, not sure, but at any rate, um, that was a slightly negative experience. Um, another slightly negative experience, but maybe a little bit less so, was the following. Uh, um, Harvard insists that if you get an honorary degree, you need a cap and gown. And it was very easy for me to go to a rental place and get a cap and gown for, for, uh, for Gelfand, but a little bit less trivial to convince him that he had to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Uh, next is uh, Mikhail Kapranov, Yale. After that, Alexander Kirillov, University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Uh, for me, it actually took uh, some time to work up the courage, the courage to attend Gelfand seminar. It was so unusual and so different. It was really an otherworldly experience and some people were saying here and we saw the video about uh, him interrupting the speaker. Uh, I understood uh, at some point rather quickly that being interrupted like this is actually a big honor. Uh, so if, if you took time to, exp this usually was interrupted for, for interrupt, uh, interruption went for the benefit of the undergraduates, of the young students in the audience. So and if uh, Gelfand thought it's worthwhile to do this, it meant that the talk was important. And one of the, 
longest interruption in my memory, probably the longest, and which was one of the rather early when I started going to the seminar, was the talk of Vladimir Drinfeld, the first talk on quantum groups, which he, he mentioned here. So the talk started with Valodya saying, let G be a semi-simple Lie algebra, and writing a Gothic letter G on the board. At this point, Gelfand intervened. And, <laughs> and was talking for at least 30 minutes, explaining to the young students in the audience that what, not about G, but about the subject of semi-simple algebras and, uh, and root systems and all the other things. It, it went for a long time. So then uh, after that, the talk continued. And uh, finally, uh, Valoja wrote a formulas for quantization which involved expressions like sinus, hyperbolic sine of x over x and so on, the product of expressions like this. At which point Gelfand said, oh, you know what, those are the Q analogs. There is an entire theory of Q analogs of special functions, which was developed in the 19th century by Father Jackson and other mathematicians. And it, in fact, it was a seminal remark, which, which now we we'll all understand about uh, Q, Q analogs and their role in quantum groups. So that's uh, one such experience. So a, a, a little later, when we start working together, uh, I spent more time with him, sometimes in, in his apartment, sometimes together with Andrei Zelevinsky, sometimes one-on-one, on, one on one, and I was able to kind of observe him in action with his family also. And one thing I was witnessing is him helping uh, to arrange jobs for other people. Because at that time, it was like the height of the stagnation, and nothing, absolutely nothing was possible. So it, it, it looked like every step in life was, was impossible. And he basically single-handedly single maintained uh, the future for young mathematicians in Moscow. And I, I was one of the persons he helped both uh, for, in with jobs and, and also for, for, uh, for medical reasons. Uh, and sometimes that required the, 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 those type of arrangement in the Soviet reality, it required dealing with people, let's say, of less than stellar character who <laughs> dominated so many, uh, so many key positions in the academia. And I remember the conversation that had at some point. He was saying, do you, like, do you think I like dealing with those people? Uh, of course, uh, I, I want to throw up every single time. But if I won't do this, then there will be no mathematics in Moscow. And th th that was also a witness to, his, uh, to, to the effort he, he put into not just in, in, to make decisions not just on a small on a small scale, but on, on the large scale, we know how uh, important is um, the importance of Moscow mathematical community. And often, uh, so especially in later years, when I have some uh, to do some moral choice, when if there is a situation which is not completely black and white, which involves lives of several people, so sometimes I ask myself, what would Gelfand do in this situation? And surprisingly, it, always, it very often provides additional light. It's sometimes really, really not clear. It's a complex situation. There is no black and white rules. Uh, Maybe I'll tell you one story that he told me, probably, again, it had some message, and it has to do with the, with the concept of kindness. It's a story about a Soviet dissident, dissident writer, Varlam Shalamov. Uh, so, so people who lived in the Soviet Union, of course, know who he was. So they, he was a, a person who spent 30 to 40 years in Soviet Gulag, and uh, from 1920s to mid-1950s, and uh, wrote a book of stories about Kolyma, the, the famous Kolyma stories. So after uh, the uh, Khrushchev thaw, he, he, he was able to return to Moscow, but he was clearly a very old, uh, very sick man. He was not a very social man. He was a lonely man. Uh, and his only source, source of 
uh, income, it, it, so, so it, it, it was, he was writing poetry, the, composing long poems in uh, 19th century Russian iambic pentameters, uh, tetrameters, and publishing them in literary magazines of the day. So when uh, the Coloma stories were published in the West, so there was a pressure from the government for him to retract this. So, and he was forced to sign a letter saying that, to write a letter saying that he disapproves of the publication and he also disapproves of the stories and something like that. They don't correspond to reality and something like that. So at the, uh, after which the other dissidents uh, in Moscow started basically stopped talking to him. And Gelfand said that that was unkind. That was not the right way to treat the person who basically had no other ch choice. And he di didn't harm any, anybody by doing what he did. And he said that he to, 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 uh, regrets, uh, to, to this day it was in the 80s, to not uh, having protested and n n not to uh, being able to, the, to help him. So uh, of course there was absolutely no reason for him to get involved in that situation. But he felt that he was treated unkindly, and it was his duty to, 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 to display real kindness. And uh, I think he meant this as some, kind of, as some kind of a lesson. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Alexander Kirillov, the University of Pennsylvania. After that, Maxim Kansevich. I'll try to be short because our time is running and we have a banquet today. And also I have a chance to speak about Gelfand uh, merits uh, on the Sunday session where we describe the contribution of Gelfand in mathematics, mathematical education and in life in Moscow. Uh, I uh, was acquainted with Gelfand all, practically all my life when we met first. I was 22 and a half, he was 43, exactly twice older than myself, and I remember him in all forms except right uh, lower angle. I think this photo is made when he was about 40, and it was before I saw him. Uh, of course, the seminar of Gilfand at first shocked anything, uh, everybody. There are many legend, many uh, exaggerated stories about this seminar. Uh, from my point of view, it's the uh, most important mathematical event in that time in Moscow. The Gilfan seminar was uh, something like uh, a window to the West because Moscow mathematician when not allowed to go to the abroad, they very uh, rare saw foreigners. Uh, I myself sat my first foreigner in uh, something 60, I guess. And before that, in Moscow, you can, of course, meet some uh, foreigners in the Moscow streets, but it was exception rather than rule, and you, don't know, you cannot speak with them. They were completely come uh, as a season of moon or other galactics. But mathematics is, a, uh, is unique. And even in most is worst uh, years of uh, Soviet regime, mathematicians found the ways to communicate. And uh, in Gelfand seminar, we saw examples of such, communica of such communications. Uh, and also, I think that's a feature of uh, Israel Moisevich. He was always a little, a little before the mode, uh, ahead the mode. For example, uh, he, wa he became famous after his works about uh, in functional analysis, Normet algebras, uh, Banach's, uh, Banach algebras, uh, maximal ideals, and so on and so on. But at that time, he, when he was became famous, he completely leave this area and start representation theory. When representation theory becomes a thing 
very popular and mood, uh, he abandoned it and got, uh, started integral geometry. Then he switched to automorphic forms, then to uh, hypergeometric functions and so on. And uh, every time people said, why you do such an unpopular thing? And uh, instead of uh, continue what you successfully did before, uh, he didn't answer this stupid question, but continues in his way. And uh, I would like also to say that it was d difficult, but uh, nice time in Moscow. We were young at that time. Uh, and seminar was not uh, a formal and boring thing. There was a lot of seminar jokes. I have even a project to collect the jokes of the seminar of, Gil of Gilfand seminar. And on my uh, uh, talk on the previous part of this conference in Moscow in July, I give a list of the, uh, not list, but uh, uh, short, uh, how to say it? Mm. Oh, there's an American word for it. Uh, Reader Digest. Reader Digest of, of the fans. <laughs> Uh, so those who are interested can see the uh, materials of the first part of this conference. Uh, here I can say only one joke, uh, not because it's the best, but because it's uh, easiest to translate. And, <laughs> and uh, because it's, I think it's important, especially for young people who are uh, present here. Uh, once. Uh, Man uh, look on the street and see his pal who is running on full speed along the street. And he shouted him, why are you rushing? The answer was, oh, you see, I'm running after the street car, and so I save uh, 15 kopecks. <laughs> <laughs> you fool. Better to run after the taxi, and you will save 10 rubles. <laughs> <laughs> The mathematical moral. If you want to imitate somebody activity in mathematics, better to choose a taxi cab than the street car. <laughs> <laughs> so I prefer to start to finish this way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Maxim Kansevich, uh, after that, and Kostand. Well, I met first uh, Gelfand when I was in uh, last year in high school. A uh, friend of family took me to the seminar to show to Gelfand. I remember there was some talk which I didn't understand at all, and another talk by Tanya Havanova. She explained she went to some conference and asked what, what, was, what she learned. And then uh, at the end of, uh, it's, uh, 11 o'clock in the evening, uh, so finally, he introduced me at the end of the seminar and asked me, asked me, what do I understand? I said, I understand, this. first I think I don't understand, I understand there was some conference. And he said, oh, it's like in Shalom Aleichem story, there was some personage with, uh, with glasses and, and one there's no glass at all, and another is uh, covered by a piece of metal, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but then next year I went to Moscow University and became student of I think Sasha Goncharov, it's better to say. So it's with Ilya Zaharevich, who was those two young students who he mentioned here. Yeah. yeah, so I was kind of protected by Sasha uh, from Gelfand. And yeah, we, we talk a little bit with Gelfand, I have to say. But, uh, and um, yeah, uh, later we, uh, in the West, we talk more. And um, at some point, uh, he uh, uh, told, uh, told several of us that. Uh, if he would, uh, would be given a uh, second life, he would become a composer. And why? Yeah, so why composer? Because he will, be, be, will meet more and more diverse people. Yeah, so he really like, uh, loved to meet people. And, uh, uh, and the last time I met Gelfand, it was maybe a year before his death. 
So it was arranged that I'll even meet in Rutgers on the seventh floor. So he was, I, w I was waiting on a bench. And then he arrived and he was very frail and uh, with, uh, with not a cane, but some kind of, not, wasn't walking uh, very slowly. So he looked on me and said, oh, uh, you changed a lot. <laughs> but, but to the best, yeah. Oh, this is Maxim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's, yeah, he, one could learn tricks all all your life here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have four uh, more speakers, and I should say that. Uh, uh, although we have 20 minutes left in the session, I was reassured that the, the conference banquet would not start without us. <laughs> so, um, so we definitely could go a little over the time to uh, give adequate uh, eight minutes to each remaining speaker. So now, as Anne Costant, and after that, Dusa McDuff. That's one of the happy occasions. They were all happy occasions. So first I want to thank the organizers, Slava in particular, for inviting me to share some of my personal memories and recollections, interactions with Israel Mosevich Galfan. It's a very sensitive thing. <laughs> I won't touch. As you would expect, some of these recollections will surely include Bert. In the early 1970s, Bert was invited to Moscow, and I was so excited to accompany him. Three eventful weeks followed, and many highlights of that period have remained with both of us to this day. I'm happy today to see so many of the friendships I, we made go back to this time, among them with the Kirillovs, Bernstein, Kajdan, Vershik, and Deacon, Novikov, who is not here, among them. Now, since my Yale days, having spent many hours on Hill House Avenue, I have been accustomed to and enjoyed being in the company of mathematicians. I found them to be very interesting people, often with original perspectives beyond mathematics, usually rather good chess players, with a love of music, history, literature, and in many instances, a zest for life. They also love to dance. My first encounter with Gelfand, Bert had seen him prior to this one, was at his invitation to have lunch with him at the Russian Academy of Sciences. I had no idea what to expect. Anyway, at the dining room, dining room table, Gelfand sat between Bert and me. They talked together for a while. I listened. And at one point, Gelfand motioned by nodding his head towards a man sitting alone, diagonally across from us. Gelfand whispered, Lysenko. And Bert said out loud, What does Gysenko? Shh, said Gelfand to Bert. And they went on with their mathematical conversation. I learned a lot about Lysenko after lunch. A few days later at the university, while Bert was meeting with colleagues, Gelfand offered to take me around Moscow. Shopping was the reason or pretext. At the Beryoshka shop, he picked out a beautiful amber necklace, which I bought for myself. Other trinkets, matryoshkas for the children, and so on. He had good taste. Then it was on to the cheese shop, the bakery for Russian black bread. And all along the way, we talked. That is, he asked a lot of questions, some rather personal. And I answered rather frankly, telling him that I was a non-mathematician with a love of French culture, the language, the literature, and 19th and early 20th century Russian literature, Pushkin, Lermontov, Gogol, 
and I had a reasonable reading knowledge at that time of Russian. He listened politely and didn't interrupt. And then he threw some more questions at me, which I answered. And that began another round of questions, different kinds. Well, he was fairly transparent, I thought, and I understood quickly that that was how he engaged people and sized them up. I'm sure much of this about the shopping, shopping resonates with many of you. A few days later, Bert and I were invited to Gelfand's home for lunch. Music was in the background. Mozart, played by Maurizio Pollini, then his favorite, became a short topic of conversation. He asked which pianist I preferred. When I said Giza King for Beethoven, he smiled and simply said, Pollini was better. <laughs> Years later, when he came to our home in Newton for dinner, he brought some music by Schnitke. After dinner in the living room, he could see that half, after half an hour that Schnitke was not to my taste. Nevertheless, he tried to encourage me to be patient and learn to appreciate this higher musical form. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> On another occasion in which I was not present, Bert recalls having dinner in Gelfand's house with many colleagues being present. Bert became ill, and Gelfand feared something serious, so he immediately began calling various <coughs> doctors for advice. Thanks to his kindness, Bert got well. Through the years that followed, Gelfand sent us New Year's greetings, always signed with love. Sometimes there were some special sentences for Bert. We were on the list, so this was not unusual. Although we were always happy, of course, to get his card. What followed, however, in the mid-1970s was a special event for me. And here I have to say I should have talked to Victor Gilliman before. Gelfand came to, Con to Cambridge for an honorary degree at Harvard. Bert and I also spent time with him for lunches, dinners, and with colleagues. It must have been the week after you, Victor. <laughs> I have no other way to reconcile the times here. <laughs> then at one point, he asked me to telephone him at 8 a.m. sharp every morning. I guess that was after the call to the KGB and arranged to pick him up at the faculty club. And so the shopping began. Not for watches this time, he had a good watch, but for pens. And at the Harvard Coop, there we went. And all the pens were laid out in a big array. And did he pick any of them? Maybe one, maybe two. But of course, we, we moved on fairly quickly. The next story might be well known to many of you, and this involves the Chestnut Hill shopping mall. At that time, there was a Florsheim shoe store. We went to this mall, and let me add, he wanted to go to even more malls, but we didn't have time. Israel took out a pattern he had drawn of a lady's boot. I think some of you know this story and asked the salesperson to bring out all the ladies' boots fitting that pattern. I, ch I chose a pair that I hoped would fit, and I imagine that this was for Tanya, and indeed, this was for Tanya. Gel Gelfand also wanted new clothes for himself. So, in Harvard Square, he tried on jackets, and eventually he bought a gray-bluish one, some trousers and shoes, he looked terrific. In 1992, when I saw him in Paris at the first European Congress, he was wearing that jacket. And I believe it's also the same one he wore one day at Bert's 1993 Festschrift. Maybe we can put the picture up. And if you notice, in the corner there, those words, that festschrift was exactly in this room 
and the same building. And I can see that he's wearing that jacket. Yeah. Okay. I have to recall Gelfand at that Feshrift banquet. Gelfand was the last speaker. He spoke movingly and with a great deal of, of emotion, I recall, about Bert's sense of beauty, which he combined with his love of mathematics and passion for mathematics. He painted some beautiful ideas, and I recall them. Well, here we all are in some of recent pictures I found. So there's that one. And here we are with Edwin Bechler on the right. I'll mention him later. Gelfand, our uh, older daughter, Abby, and Elizabeth, our younger daughter then, in the background. She's here today and senior editor. Anyway, the trip was coming to an end. With our children, we drove Gelfand to New York City. Along the way, Gelfand recited some Russian poetry, which he knew by heart. He talked of Ahmadova, Gogol, Shekhov, and somehow he also managed to engage our children. He made a lasting impression on them, not forgotten to this day. We all visited Mark Katz at Rockefeller Center, and then we went to one of my old haunts, a cafe in Greenwich Village, where our two older children joined us. One topic centered around films. Our son Stephen was making films at the time. Some jokes were told about the Stanislavski method, and Burke brought up one of our favorite films, Jean Renoir's La Grande Illusion. Gelfand expressed an intense dislike for that film, but he liked the tea. Gelfand's visit was coming to an end. Before we got into the car to drive him to the airport, we hugged and said our goodbyes and pretty much drove in silence along the highway. Bert recalls Gelfand's remark about a billboard on the highway promoting cigars. They were called admiration cigars. And Gelfand comment, commented, that's what Americans admire, cigars? We could see he was preparing to cross the, re the threshold and return home. We parked our car and walked him to a certain area at the airport. Three men greeted him. Gelfand shook their hands and then in a very formal way this time, looked at us, waved goodbye, and walked off. I knew, however, that he had been awakened nevertheless to a new kind of life and that he would eventually return to this country. And so he did. In 1989-90, he did indeed arrive in Cambridge with Tanya and Tanya. He gave talks at MIT, Harvard, <coughs> engaged the larger math community, and soon actually formally emigrated with his family. We spent a lot of time together in those days, and we did what we could to help the, Gel the Gelfand family settle in. He came to our home from time to time, and he was clearly comfortable with our family. On one Thanksgiving, we invited the Gelfands, along with some newly arrived Russian families, the Kajdans among them, to, uh, to Thanksgiving. I recall that when dinner was just about over and the adult talk began, Gelfand strolled off into the living room and took several younger children, daughter Tanya and our granddaughter Rebecca, with him. Gelfand asked for scissors and paper and started to design some shapes. The children were very happy to be with him. At one point, our older daughter, Shoshana, 
she was a bit older, wandered into the living room and recalls how Gelfam began to write and give her some simple problems, math problems. As she solved each one, he gave her some more. And it continued like that for a while. Shoshana, now a high school math teacher at Brookline High, remembers how she gradually came to understand what he was getting at. He was a fantastic communicator with children. During this period, I was an editor at Bierkäuser, now Springer. Gelfand used to come to the Bierkäuser office in Central Square, and we talked a lot, and about many things. Sometimes I also helped him by editing a bit his letters, although his English was pretty good and getting better all the time. He also asked me to help him fix his talk when he was to receive the Kyoto Prize. The topic was his thoughts on, as Tanya mentioned, adequate language, but also his thoughts on globalization. I learned a lot about his vision and his, per and his perspective, which I must say was futurist futuristic. No one talked about such things at that time. He also initiated some discussions and ideas about projects he would like to have published. And I'd also like to add that Tanya also visited me in the Cambridge office from time to time. In 1992, when Israel, Tanya, and I met in Paris during the first European Congress for Mathematics, we solidified plans to begin publication of Selecta Mathematica new series. Edwin Beschler, who was in one of the, those pictures, and the first issue uh, appeared in 1993. Once Gelfand moved to Rutgers, the journal continued with Gelfand at the helm and with the help of Kajdan. Retach and Amy Cohen, Robert Wilson, and a prominent board of editors, excuse me, some of whom are here today. Gelfand remained the editor-in-chief for many years, but increasingly in the background when his health began to fail. Several years ago, Kajdan, Ettingoff, and Seidel took over Selecta, with many of the original editorial board still actively participating, some of them here today, and new mathematicians having come on board. This journal is growing and flourishing. In fact, Selecta Mathematica is one of the few mathematics journals that accepts longer articles, all depending on whether a paper meets the journal's criteria for excellence. I'm very happy to have a role and be a part of this ongoing area of Gelfand's legacy. My publishing activities with Gelfand continued during his Rutger years. This included the school by correspondence, which Tanya spoke about, an outreach program consisting of texts for high school students. Two of the books originally in Russian for the school by correspondence were translated into English and several other language and have worldwide distribution. These books were followed by algebra with Sasha Shen and trigonometry with Mark Saul. Tanya is actively completing the geometry book, as she mentioned, and I and a number of other people will be very happy to see its publication realized in the near future. At Rutgers, as mentioned, Gelfand had held his weekly seminar on Monday afternoon, bringing in mathematicians from everywhere in the world to speak. Some mathematicians who participated are here today. From 1990 to 1999, I worked with Gelfand and with the help of daughter Elizabeth, now a senior editor at Springer, four memorable volumes were published, including one called the Arnold Gelfand Seminars. Also, the Discriminants book with Kapranov and Jelovinsky and lastly, the Gelfand Festschrift, the unity of mathematics in the 20th century in two volumes, round out some of my publishing activities with Gelfand. 
all of these memorable publications remain read readily available on Springer Link. One final memorable night sticks in my memory when Israel came to Boston and was staying at the Kajdans. On a freezing snowy night, it was the Sabbath, Gelfand with Kajdan's help came to us to dinner and planned to spend the night at our home. With his heavy brown briefcase in hand, they trudged, hiked through the deep snow from Kajdan's house to ours, about a 30 minute walk under normal conditions. The next day, I drove Gelfand after breakfast to wherever he wanted to go. And before leaving our house, he said, I am accustomed to becoming an American now. We were friends. There was much to admire and love about Gelfand. From our point of view, we knew about the complexities of his life, but there was no doubt that he was a mensch and an inspiration in our lives. Thank you very much. Um, next, Dusa Magdaf, and uh, after that, uh, Anatoly Vershik. Well, it's very late, and so I'm going to be rather brief. Um, I was Gelfand's student for six months, a long, long time ago, in the winter of 1969 to 70. So he was a great inspiration for me and source of strength for many years. He had a transformative effect on my career, and I just want to tell you a little bit about how he taught me. So how I got to Moscow at that time, I'd been a student at Edinburgh University and then done a PhD in the University of Cambridge in England, um, I, it sort of worked very quickly. I was very specialized and I'd spent two years and I'd done a project on von Neumann algebras. I was also married to somebody who was interested in Russian poetry and writing a, a dissertation on Inokenty Anyansky, who was a symbolist Russian poet. And so he had to, as part of his dissertation, he had to go to Moscow to study. And so I went along, I got a scholarship and I went there, but nobody had told me that I had to think what I might do when I got there. I just sort of went there. I was very dutiful, I was used to doing what I was told. Anyway, when I got to Moscow, they asked me at the office, who do you want to study with? And luckily, the person whose name came to mind was Gelfand. So I said, well, Gelfand. So they called up Gelfand, and we just, he just arranged to meet me. He'd known nothing about this. So I met him just before his seminar. Now, he wanted to know why I was in Moscow, and I told him I was there because my husband was writing a PhD on inner Kanti Anyansky. Then he wanted to know what mathematics I'd done, and I said, well, I'd written this, you know, I'd solved this problem in von Neumann algebras. And then he said, well, I'm much more interested in the fact that David is writing his PhD on Inokenshi Anyansky <laughs> than that you solved this problem in von Neumann algebras. Um, anyway, so that, that's what the first thing he said to me. And then he sort of wanted to know what he could do with me, right? Because I was going to be a student for six months. And so he... Um, he gave me, he was working with Fuchs at that time on Gelfand Fuchs cohomology, and he gave me this paper called The Lie Algebra, the Cohomology of Lie Algebra of Lie Algebra of Vector Fields on a Manifold. And I had to confess to him that I didn't know what any of those words meant. I was really, really narrow. But you see, he was completely undaunted. He just saw, saw me, I mean, there I was. He told me what to do. You know, I'd go to Kirillov's lectures on, on Lee, Lee groups, I'd read certain books, I read Isla Mergham Klein, I read all kinds of things. He just told me what to do. I went to his seminar. I gave, um, actually, I gave a seminar, but you know, he was my translator, so that meant I said one sentence and he said 10 sentences, and then I said <laughs> one sentence possible. Anyway, we did this. And then he also talked to me before the seminar. So he, he would explain a lot of things to me, which I didn't understand, but I was completely amazed by the way he, he was telling me about mathematics. I mean, he told me that he had some idea that he'd written several papers, or even books about, but he didn't quite work. You know, 
wasn't quite what he meant to say. So a few years later, he returned to the same subject from a completely different angle and sort of worked at it some more. And then I, I hadn't understood that mathematics was like that. You know, I thought mathematics was sort of discrete theorems. You'd work on something, you'd prove it, then you'd work on something else. But that was not his vision at all. And he did manage to impart his vision to me. Um, later on, I, I met at his house, and he was amazing. I mean, he obviously talked to me about mathematics there, but what I remember from there was him reading Mo Pushkin's Mozart and Sal Salieri to me, that he, um, that he got out his big Pushkin. In fact, he gave me a, his volume of, one of his volumes of Pushkin, you know, and, but he translated Mozart and Salieri for me, which was amazing to me. And he also invited my husband for dinner sometimes, and we'd have wonderful dinners, he'd tell all these anecdotes, you know, it was absolutely great. And I was, um, you know, I, at that time I would think of myself as a would-be mathematician, and he was, and my husband, I was married to a would-be poet, and the fact that Gelfand saw that reading poetry to me and reading music to me and all this was part of teaching me mathematics, that was really important to me, and I think that's why he had such a, an influence on me, because he thought it was all part of this, having the same vision. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say, so thank you. Thanks. Anatoly Vershek of uh, St. Petersburg uh, State University and St. Petersburg branch of uh, the Steklov Institute of Mathematics. Well, uh, Gilfant is a great person, great scientist of 20th century. He attracted many, many people, I think maybe thousands of scientists in his orbit. Uh, I was in St. Petersburg and Leningrad at that time. He told me that uh, I am his pupil by correspondence. And we have some research and so on. Well, but uh, let me say that the end of my speech I will tell during the banquet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's really, pro you know, bring the banquet closer. So, uh, Vladimir Retach, Rutgers University. Well, I try to be brief, but not as brief as Professor Vershik. Okay. Um, uh, so, if you ask me about so Gulf and mathematics, it's very hard actually to answer this. But I should just mention two things. Um, but first of all, that he always tried to look at basic examples. So his mathematics was like based on several very basic and rather elementary things. And on top of this, it was like this intuition. So the Gelfand intuition was actually legendary. And I heard this from many people. And also what is really connected with the simple examples was that, uh, again, more general simplicity. Gelfand was very proud that he can do simple things. Uh, he liked to quote a, a professor from Moscow who was saying that Gelfand does not prove hard theorems. He could actually make any theorem easy. Okay, and uh, also that Gelfand also tr from time to time would tell about one of his former students and, which, and Gelfand asked him, what did you learn from me? And the answer was, I learned how to do mathematics by using simple examples. And Gelfand asked, and did you succeed? And the answer was not entirely. You could always find better examples and simpler examples. Right, now, and you know, sometimes I had an impression that mathematics for him, you know, like a favorite toy for a child. I remember that when visiting him in a sanatorium near Moscow, when he lived actually in a small room, and 
It, the table was like this side. It was not it was impossible to work on this table. So we were staying on our on our knees and writing in our notebooks on, on his bed. And Galfan was laughing like a child. He was saying, look at these formulas, how nice they are. They actually telling us what to do. Actually, it was always his advice, follow formulas. Formulas, formulas are wiser than we are. <laughs> right. it, now, the, our co co the collaboration with Galfan was uh, like multifaceted and it was actually unpredictable. Well, he could say, and we never, it was never a concrete problem with me. Gelfand would say, can we go into this direction? And we would start, you know, experiments after experiments and uh, see how this works. And uh, sometimes Gelfand would say, why do you, f uh, why, uh, why don't you follow my ideas? Uh, that's it's, uh, well, uh, you, you should have some respect to me. But the next day, Galfan would say, well, you abandoned what you were saying and you follow what I was doing. And it was stupid. <laughs> okay, I gave a foolish advice it, and it's just enough to have one fool in our company. So that's... Uh, it was this, uh, so and this and that. Now, when working with Gelfand again, that's so. So you could work and work, and ba basically you cannot see how it's going. And then Gelfand would say, "We are doing something strange." How, for example, how would explain this to Deline what we are doing? And I would try to say, "Well, I would." Do the, I would explain in this way or in that way, and Gelfand would say, but he would just laugh at you. <laughs> and okay, and we will continue, continue, and eventually, uh, so the work will actually get some shape. And Gelfand would say, oh, that's wonderful. See, so we really did it. And then I would ask, and how you would explain this to Deline? Galfan said, why should you explain this to somebody? You know, you, 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 I know that we are right, and you know that I'm right. <laughs> why? Okay, so that's this one. Now, the, uh, the other thing, of course, that sometimes his questions were unexpected. Uh, he would like to actually to compare himself with other mathematicians. I remember that he asked me, do you know what is the difference between me and von Neumann? And I would try to say something, Galfan interrupted me and say, I was always working with functional spaces. So this, this Banach algebras, I presented Banach algebras as functional, as a space of functions, and I did representation theory in the space of functions. And uh, von Neumann worked actually with the uh, you know, abstract operators in Hilbert spaces. So that's um, so this one. What uh, he also would tell me that do not make any conceptions. Do not work with conceptions. Try to make variations. As his actually mathematical ideal, he would rather see um, Felix Klein rather than Hilbert. He told me that he would never formulate it, you know, like 10 or 20 problems to solve. He actually very valued sort of artistic approach, like it was in this. And, okay, so that's... and. Also, I should tell that I got actually a lot of advice actually from him how to teach. And uh, one of his advice was, for example, that first make students comfortable in your class and then try to teach them. But just to give you just one example of his approach to teaching, is the story that one of his former students couldn't find a job. It was a 
that time in Moscow, and he was teaching at a school for police officers and tried to teach them fractions how, and they couldn't get it. For example, they could not understand what, how to compare two over three or three over five. And the advice that he got from Gelfand was the following, just ask him, you have two bottles of vodka for three people, or you have three bottles of vodka for five people, and who will drink more? <laughs> and they understood it immediately. <laughs> and uh, another story of this time, so we were doing mathematics in his kitchen in Moscow, and a very important, Somebody called and said that, well, I have a son, he is 12 years old, and he has problems with mathematics. Can you help? And I, I could not predict the girlfriend's reaction, but girlfriend just asked the boy to pick up the phone, and he said, I will ask you just three questions. What is one times one? What is one times negative one? And what is negative one times negative one? And the boy was able just to answer two questions, first two questions. Kelvin said, great, you already know two thirds of all mathematics. <laughs> you ju just do a little bit of effort and you will know everything. <laughs> Maybe it was the best actual lesson in, in you know, how to teach mathematics in my life. So I will probably stop here. Thank you. So I guess we could go on and on and on because there are many more people in this room who uh, knew uh, Israel Gelfand very well and were touched by his... Uh, um, genius and his warm attitude. Uh, we'll uh, hope there will be uh, talks at the banquet where people could also share memories. Uh, also, I would, as a historian, I would encourage you to approach me and maybe uh, we could uh, set up time and talk more at length about your memories of Israel Gelfand. Uh, but uh, generally, I just wish to thank you all for sharing your memories, for coming here, and I hope that uh, the memory of uh, Israel Gelfand will live on not only in his 560 publications, but also in our hearts. Thank you. I should, I should also explain how we divided responsibilities with Pavel Etingov. Uh, my responsibility was to chair the session, and his was to explain the directions to the banquet. That's right. So I'm not going to say anything about Gelfand, at least now. Uh, but uh, I will tell you the quick way to the banquet. Uh, so this is a picture, the map here. Uh, so uh, so we, are, we are right here. This is the entrance. The entrance is on the main street. But actually the quickest way to cross is to cross the street here and cross the railroad. Right next to the building. I've been talking about tickets all these two days, but if you don't, uh, but actually you don't need the tickets because there is plenty of seats. <laughs>